Australia's military history is more than just a collection of dates and the locations of war-ravaged battlefields. It is the stories of service and sacrifice of those who have answered the call of their country of birth or adoption and the enduring legacy they have created. Join me as we look into one of those stories. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's Military History, a Doc Network podcast. Now let's get started. G'day friends and welcome to the fifth and final installment of the life, service and legacy of Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor. I honestly didn't expect it would take five parts to tell his story, but here we are. If this is the first time that you're joining the podcast, I do strongly recommend going back to the beginning of the story of Ralph Honor, as there is too much backstory to recap at the start of an episode. But before we finish Honor's story, there are some updates that I wanted to share. Firstly, the podcast has had its first episode cross the 200 list and milestone, which is amazing as very few podcasts do so, and I want to thank everyone for giving the podcast a chance. Some listeners have also left comments on some previous episodes. ATM, who's also one of our Ko-Fi backers, left a comment on Sister Florence Kason's episode. Quote, A fitting recognition of the significant contribution by nurses in war times and today. Unquote. And Lorraine left a comment on the episode on Rail Air Commodore Charles Kingsford Smith. Quote, Fantastic as always. Unquote. Thank you both for your feedback, and remember, over on Spotify, you can join in on the conversation and leave feedback on every episode, which greatly helps the show reach the ears of people who may like to hear it. Speaking of conversation, over on the podcast Discord server, there's currently a discussion going on about the final merch designs, so if you want to join the so-called Armored Emu Brigade, follow the link in the show description. And with that out of the way, let's get on with the finale of Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor. On the 30th of November 1942, Lieutenant Colonel Honor, commanding officer of the 39th Australian Infantry Battalion, along with his intelligence officer, Lieutenant McNamara, his RMO, Captain Shearer, and portions of C&D companies boarded planes for Popendetta, the provincial capital of Oro province on the Papuan Peninsula, and then moved a blistering 15 kilometres inland to Saputa at the base of the Owen Stanley Ranges. There, they rested for a night as they waited for the rest of the battalion to arrive the following day. After General George Allen Vasey, commander of the 7th Division, led his force into Kokoda on the 2nd of November, the Allies continued to chase after the Japanese who were conducting a fighting retreat back to their fortified coastal positions at Buna, Gona and San Ananda on the northeastern coast of Papua. This space of land is roughly 19 kilometres long from Cape Endenary on the northeastern coast, stretching west along the Amboga River, which is roughly 38 square kilometres of defended Japanese territory. And despite the fact that these men were malnourished, weakened by tropical diseases and lacking reinforcements due to successive Allied operations in the southwest Pacific area, the Japanese were making the Allies fight for every square centimetre of what was predominantly kunai grasslands, coconut plantations, and thick, impassable swamps. While this was happening, Honor was retraining his battalion fresh with reinforcements and recruits, passing on his experience to his comparatively much younger men, and thus missed the tail end of the Kokoda campaign. But his unit was fresh as the Allies launched a three-axis attack towards the Japanese beachheads at the behest of Commander-in-Chief Southwest Pacific General Douglas MacArthur, who wanted the positions taken as quickly as possible. By 18th of November, advance elements of one of General Vasey's two columns had made it as far as Gona, but wouldn't successfully take it until the 9th of December and would cost the Australians heavily in the process. The force that was tasked with taking San Ananda, which sat between Buna and Gona, fell short by the 21st of November, taking heavy losses. Buna would bleed the comparatively inexperienced American forces who were forced back in disarray. In response to the staggering casualties for comparatively minimal gains, General MacArthur and Commander-in-Chief Allied Ground Forces, Australian General Sir Thomas Blaney, had a terse directed conference on what reinforcements to send across the Owen Stanleys to continue the attack, of which they had two American units and two Australians to choose from. One of these was the 30th Militia Brigade the 39th was a part of. Blaney, who still resented MacArthur's criticism of the Australian troops during Kokoda and and Milton Bay operations, the sentiment stemmed from comparatively low casualty rates indicating to MacArthur a lack of resolve in the Australian forces, pushed for those same Australian forces to be involved as he determined that the American forces weren't to the same level as the Australian militia, let alone the calibre of the Australian Imperial Force. Despite having significantly large numbers of American troops on hand, Blamey told MacArthur, quote, at least I know the Australians will fight, unquote. 
On the 29th of November, the 21st Australian Imperial Force Brigade entered battle, the same day that Honor received orders to have his entourage board planes on the 30th and were initially put into the line to block the possibility of Japanese seaborne reinforcements. On the 2nd of December, General Vasey held a brigade conference to coordinate the next phase of the attack and initially assigned the 30th Brigade to relieve the 25th Brigade at Gona. Under reports from San Ananda saw the 39th redeployed to assist with its capture. Honor led his initial force, C and D companies, towards the fortified Japanese coastal positions around San Ananda and were placed under the command of the 21st Brigade. The rest of the battalion would follow that afternoon. Hanna realised very quickly that the route along the coast from his position to San Ananda that he had been assigned was comprised of thick scrub and swampland and thus was not suitable for troop movement. As his men paused on the beach as a more suitable track was discovered, Honor and his men had another run-in with Allied air power. This time, it was a Royal Australian Air Force bow fighter. Both fighters from number 30 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, had been attacking Japanese beach positions and reinforcement points when one plane peeled off from the attack and apparently mistaking the Australians for Japanese, strafed the beach and wounded five soldiers. Honestly, Honor's had the oddest luck with aircraft during this war. Honor was extremely critical initially of the conduct of the 21st Brigade and made his objections known after the fact. By the 4th of December, the 39th had entered the front line and relieved the 3rd Battalion on the outskirts of Gona, assuming two positions. He held the left flank of a large, featureless piece of ground between Gona Creek and the main access track, and the right flank facing Japanese positions but was obstructed by scrub, jungle and swampland. As war often goes, Honor received orders from the Brigade Commanding Officer, Brigadier Ivan Doherty, on the 5th to attack in concert with the severely depleted 2nd 27th, 2nd 16th Composite Battalion from his exposed left flank the following day. When these orders were relayed back to his battalion, that it was an attack through Kunai Grass, then an 80 metre dash across bare ground facing heavily fortified bunkers with machine gun emplacements, the officers there understandably protested and an event that Honor would later recall as his greatest military regret, voiced his own opposition to the attack, but unfortunately didn't escalate that opposition. The attack was going to take place. In an attack more reminiscent of the First World War than the Pacific Campaign, the frontal charge was a costly failure. Honor would write, quote, Our orders were to attack directly from the front, I do not know why, because I protested against the idea, but these were the orders, I take it they must have fitted into some plan that was beyond my conception. The only support from another subunit was a section from B Company, which was to provide flanking protection along the track should D Company's attack succeed. Their flanking protection, which went in where the attack should have gone in, around the flank of the Japanese positions, was able to go right through the jungle behind the bunkers, go on, find out what was there, and get into a sight of the village. But as the attack had failed, they had to come back, unquote. This attack would cost 12 men killed and 46 wounded, which considering the force at the time comprised only two platoons, was catastrophic for the unit. Another attack was planned the following day, much to Honor's horror, as he didn't want to watch another of his companies be decimated in a foolish attack and he was looking for a way out. Now remember how I just then I said how Honor had an odd relationship with air power? Well, the assigned air support for his attack arrived and promptly dropped, quote, a paltry few bombs behind his own line, unquote. An infuriated Honor, who had endured Luftwaffe attacks in Greece and Crete, according to D Company Commander Captain Bidstrup, quote, I remember Ralph standing up and saying, give me a squadron of Stukas, unquote. This was, fortunately, enough justification for Honor to call off the attack in its entirety, stating that the failed air support had, quote, jeopardized its chance of success, unquote. He suggested a follow-up attack solely through the jungle approaches, and this was approved. Because of this postponement, Honor was able to reconnoiter the terrain he was about to commit troops to, and in drawing on his wide experiences as a soldier and his adherence to the principles of war to prepare the attack, which was to be one of three simultaneous attacks on the Gona mission. Despite his request, Brigadier Doherty still ordered an attack on Honor's exposed left flank, and again, banking whatever goodwill he had gained with the general owing to his experience, Honor decided to, quote, modify the attack, unquote. He ordered his C Company to open fire along the left flank, but not to advance, to keep it intact long enough to follow A and D companies through the right flank once they had breached the Japanese defences through the jungle. Thanks to his experience in North Africa, he brought up his plans, quote, 
I knew from experience that infantry could fight under their own artillery bombardment, and using their own bombardment, they could use surprise to catch the enemy unawares, unquote. He arranged for the artillery forward observer to order his barrage on Japanese positions, using shells fused to detonate after they were buried in the soft ground. If they managed to pierce the Japanese defensive structures, they could detonate inside them. If they missed, the shockwave would stun them, and causing enough confusion in the two-minute window he had allocated between the end of the barrage and the start of the attack to allow his men to get the jump on the Japanese. Long after the war, Hana was interviewed about this attack on Ghana Mission. Quote, a Company's little attack was an extraordinary success. Post after post fell to them, but there was a severe time gap between their attack and the arrival of C Company from across the other side of the track to support them. Into that time gap, the reinforced D Company, including the platoon, which was not engaged in the attack on the 6th of December, were thrown straight after A Company to maintain and expand the impetus of the attack, and behind D Company came C Company, pouring across from the other side of the track fully armed and ready to go. The impetus of the attack carried them through the Japanese network of posts until they reached the Sago Swamp, which was an integral part of the Japanese line of defense, unquote. The next phase of the attack called for A Company to split with one platoon moving to the left of the swamp and another to the right, to continue to clear the Japanese posts heading towards the mission school which dominated the battlefield. With the Japanese cut off into two isolated pockets, the following day, the fittest attempted a breakout either towards the coast or further inland. With orders to open fire on anything that moved above ground, the Australian forces simply dug in around Gona and waited till morning. By morning of the 9th of December, the 39th had control of the village, and when his signal sergeant approached, Honda delivered a simple message back to General Doherty. Quote, Gona's gone, unquote. As the day progressed, the horrors of what had transpired became more apparent. The village and surrounding beach had been bombed and strafed several times since the start of the Kokoda campaign by Allied air power, which meant that the scene was littered with bodies and because the Japanese had been forced to stay in their defensive structures, hygiene and sanitation conditions created a site that left lasting memories to those who saw it. Quote, We reverently buried our gallant dead and moved out as burial parties went in to dispose of the Japanese. They had buried 638 of them by the end of the next day. But many days later, we still stumbled over the ones they didn't find, or momentarily stopped brushing our teeth in the lagoons as decayed bodies nudged past us. We do not envy the burial parties, unquote. The Battle of Ghana cost Hona 6 dead and 115 wounded, but they still had a war to fight. So the following day, the 10th of December, 1942, General Doherty sent the 39th inland to cut new tracks onto the west of Ghana Mission to cut off the Japanese remnants operating between the mission and and the village of Gona, three miles away. So they departed early in the morning with six days' rations and as much ammunition they could carry, and set off towards the Amboga River and the isolated Japanese Amboga force, now establishing itself within a defensive perimeter around a village known as Hattie's Village, or as Gona West. In Hana's own words, quote, All went well till we reached the Amboga River, and turned north to surprise the Japanese garrison in the village whose strength we did not know. As we advanced with B Company that had been reserved at Gona Mission, three Japanese officers came down from the village to have a swim at the creek and track junction that we had just left. There was no opportunity to jump them without somebody opening fire because they were armed with pistols and swords as well as towels, unquote. Hana issued the difficult order. Deal with the three officers and then B Company was to charge straight down the main track towards the village. One section quickly established a foothold within the Japanese defensive positions and this allowed the rest of the company to launch its attack, which it did with devastating efficiency. Moving from Japanese position to Japanese position, with the three platoons working in concert to flank and outflank Japanese oppositions for four sustained hours until nightfall, the 39th was within sight of Hattie's village, but the advance had been costly, especially to officers and NCOs, which prompted Hana to order his men to dig in. Around midnight on the 11th of December, the Japanese launched a counterattack which decimated one platoon almost to the man. When the Japanese dead were inspected, Hana discovered that these men were part of a freshly landed force. They were well fed and well armed and equipped, which was the exact opposite of his weary, malaria riddled and understrength force. With insufficient troops to take Hattie's village, at this point the battalion was barely at company strength. Honda decided to cut the village off from reinforcements or escape across the Amberger River. 
It took six days of slow, methodical fighting under the support from Allied artillery against, at times, suicidal Japanese resistance as they tried to break out from the ever-tightening Australian net. The 39th was initially being supported by the 2nd 14th, who had been holding blocking positions on the western side of the river, but due to its own losses, the 2nd 14th, now barely 30 men by the 16th, fell under Honor's command and joined it on the attack on Hattie's village. The village would be taken on the 16th, and the final Japanese strong points falling on the 18th, and during this time, Honor reflected proudly on the conduct of his largely inexperienced troops. When Hana took command of the 39th at Ishirava, their conduct had been seen as their defining moment. Their actions at Gona was their ultimate triumph for them and the militia. These so-called chocolate soldiers conducted themselves in a resounding professional feat of arms that would have done any unit anywhere and at any time proud. And it was Hana's adherence to the military principles of concentration and economy of force that was a resounding factor to this success. For his actions in the initial attack on Gona, Honor would be awarded a Companion of the Distinguished Service Order. The citation read, quote, Lieutenant Colonel Honor commanded 39 Australian Infantry Battalion, which was under command of 21 Australian Infantry Brigade in the Gona area from the 2nd of December 42 until the 21st of December 42. From the 5th of December to the 9th of December inclusive, 39 Battalion participated in the attacks on the Eastern Enemy positions at Gona Mission. These attacks culminated in the capture of Gona Mission area on 9th of December 1942. On 10th of December, Lieutenant Colonel Honor was ordered to move through the jungle with his battalion and destroy a detachment of enemy about two miles west of Gona Mission. He made contact with the enemy in marshy country surrounding the village on the 11th of December 1942. From that day until 18 December, 39 battalion slowly but surely destroyed the enemy detachment, the destruction of which was its object, killing approximately 150 enemies and wounding a considerable number. During all these operations, Lieutenant Colonel Honor exercised close personal control, making frequent visits to the forward companies in order to coordinate attacks. At no time did he spare himself, he frequently exposed himself to great personal danger in order to get the best from his troops and was at all times an inspiration to officers as men. It is recommended that he be awarded the Distinguished Service Order as a periodic award in the dispatch of the New Guinea campaign." Unquote. Honor also changed his opinion and gained a new respect for the 21st Brigade that his battered 39th had fought alongside. The 2nd 14th held the line at Ishirava alongside him and the 2nd 16th fought the same fighting with retreat along the Kokoda Trail. The 2nd 16th and 2nd 27th threw themselves at the enemy at Gona and what remained of the 2nd 14th joined him on the attack on Hattie's village. Interestingly though, due to the recruitment regions of AIF units, a number of the 2nd 16th were former students of Honor's from Hale School, who Honor then handed Hattie's village over to and ordered what remained of his beloved 39th to make their way back to Gona Mission. It was a slow slog considering how exhausted and weakened the men had been, but when they arrived, according to Honor, quote, many of us had our first wash for three weeks, and many who saw who their sodden feet for the first time in 20 days, red raw and white swollen hobbled weakly around in bandages instead of boots, unquote. The men didn't have a long respite before orders were received on the 21st of December that the 39th was to participate in the attack on San Ananda. And on the 22nd of December, commander of the 7th Australian Division, Major General Vasey, paid the battalion a visit. Not long after the general's departure, Honor was debilitated with a severe case of malaria and was evacuated to an advanced dressing station. In doing so, he handed command of the battalion to Major Anderson, his second in command. Honor would spend five days recovering from his condition, before he felt sufficiently fit to have risen, washed, and shaved, and then promptly excused himself from the hospital to resume command of his unit and participated in the joint Australian-American containment operation of San Ananda. This was because General Vasey determined that until Boona had been taken, there wasn't enough available forces on the peninsula or experienced and strange soldiers to take San Ananda itself. On New Year's Eve 1942, the 163rd Regiment of the 41st Infantry Division, United States Army, arrived at San Ananda, and on the 2nd of January, that unit relieved the 39th. Honor and his troops, now counting only 150 of all ranks, was reassigned to the 30th Australian Infantry Brigade and ordered into garrison positions near Saputa, with the unit being organised into three groups of 50. 
By the 5th of January, the jungle conditions had claimed enough men, the unit now had to be reduced even further to two groups instead of three. Due to the depletion, Honor assumed command of a paltry force of the 39th and what remained of the 2nd 7th Australian Cavalry Regiment in order to undertake guard duty of supply depots for the 18th Brigade, as well as escorting Papua and porters and guarding their camp from Japanese aggression. By the 23rd, the 39th comprised of 7 officers and 25 other ranks. They were finally ordered off the line and to march to Dobadura Airfield to return to Port Moresby. Honor described the march in an interview 51 years later. Quote, Down to this point, the war was almost becoming a farce for us. We were only a remnant and we were malaria ridden. But as we marched back towards Saputa, we were told we were to march to Dobadura the next day to the airfield to be evacuated. Our RMO reported to Brigade that some of our troops were not capable of marching to Dobadura and would have to have transport because they were tottering with malaria. They could hardly stand, let alone walk. The edict from Brigade was that transport was to be provided to pick up all stragglers, but the battalion would march to Dobadura. I said, the 39th Battalion wouldn't have any stragglers, so you won't need to pick any of them up. We marched to Dobadura. It was a hot day, a long march. We marched all the way, but mostly we marched in columns of three. Two blokes supporting the one in the middle, and truckloads of cheering troops went past us. These were the stragglers, who hadn't seen, many of them, much campaigning and less fighting. When we got to Dobadura, we made an effort. We went back into parade ground formation, one single file. We marched across the Dobadura airfield, and the spectators came out to see this unusual sight, and one of them said, What mob's this? And we ignored them, looking straight ahead and marching at attention. But my 2IC marching at the end of the line barked, this is not a mob, this is the 39th, unquote. Just before we continue, here's a word from one of our sponsors. This episode was made possible thanks to the generous support from our backers, whose donations go towards paying for distribution and streaming costs, the digitization and procurement of records, as well as everything else that goes into making a podcast. And if you enjoy what we do here at I Was Only Doing My Job and want to support the podcast directly and get some sweet rewards in the process, follow the link in the episode description or visit our website to buy the podcast a coffee, either as a one-off or as an ongoing subscription. At the lowest tiers, you'll get episodes early and ad-free, and at higher tiers, you'll get a mention in the episode and even the ability to suggest future topics. For more information, check the link in the episode description or check out www.thedocnetwork.net. And now, let's get back to the show. After recovering from their experiences on Kokoda and the Buna Gona Sananda campaigns, the 39th boarded the transport ship HMAT Duntroon on the 12th of March 1943 and arrived in Cairns the following night. They then travelled by train to the Atherton Tablelands to parade before Brigadier Porter as part of the 30th Brigade. On the 24th of March, the men of the 39th were granted 14 days leave. Honor had a number of administrative tasks he had to undertake, namely filing reports and recommendations for citations and awards to be completed, before he joined his wife Marjorie in their Nedlands home back in Perth on the 16th of March. Little is known about what took place during those 14 days, considering to Marjorie the man who stood before her was but a shadow of the man who left. However, once we take into account what happened at the end of the year, some educated guesses can be made as the couple would welcome their third child, our daughter Margaret Cecile, in December. Honor returned to the 39th in late April and began for the third time in the war of reorganizing and retraining a battalion. On the 1st of July, he officially opened the officers' mess and its first official function was the announcement that the following day, the 39th Australian Infantry Battalion was being disbanded. That morning, a bleary-eyed Ralph Honor, who had understandably relinquished his normal professional countenance at the news that the 2nd Battalion was being taken away from him and broken up piecemeal, had imbibed probably more than usual and addressed his men for the last time. He told them, quote, Before you marched into other units, I want you to take off your 39 Battalion colour patches. It would break my heart if a 39th man was told to remove his colour patches, unquote. His men were then broken up and dispersed throughout the militia and the RAF. Honor was no different, though he didn't go to an unfamiliar post. On the 9th of July, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor, DSO, MC, was ordered to take command of the 2nd 14th Australian Infantry Battalion 
And to quote W.B. Russell in the book, The Second 14th Australian Infantry Battalion, quote, Lieutenant Colonel Honor was one of the most capable, courageous, and versatile officers in the second AIF. The battalion welcomed him as an old friend, so that from the start there existed an implicit mutual confidence between CO and unit, which is essential in an infantry battalion, unquote. Throughout July, Honor trained in the rebuilt 2nd 14th, using the lessons learned from his experiences in North Africa, Greece, and Crete, and the lessons learned from the Python campaign. Though his leadership style was apparently difficult for some of the officers and men of the battalion to get used to, as quoted by Captain Jerry O'Day, commander of D Company at the time. Quote, Ralph worked almost exclusively through his company commanders. He gave clear orders, often reading them off the back of a letter from his wife with his wire-rimmed glasses, and hence his orders were concise. He expected orders to be carried out with every assistance from him, but with minimal interference. It took him time to develop a firm relationship with his officers being, by nature, shy, unquote. At the end of July, Honor and half of the 2nd 14th departed Townsville aboard HMAT Duntroon to return to Port Moresby, with the remainder arriving six days later aboard the HMAT Taruna. They were deployed to the Austin's Crossing to prepare for the planned capture of the Huon Peninsula. While in camp, Honor made preparations on the 21st of July to allow the battalion to participate in the federal election for 1943, because in Western democracies, elections still happen, even in wartime. Aside from this, the 2nd 14th continued to train and familiarize themselves with new weapons, technology, and tactics for fighting in the jungle until the 14th of September when orders were received that the unit was to prepare to move by plane to the airfield at Nadzab. There, they landed the following day at 0635. This operation followed the airborne landings on the 5th of September, conducted by American paratroopers and members of the Australian 2nd 4th Field Company to assist in the landings at Ley. Now, the operations at Nadzab and Ley will be the focus of upcoming episodes, as Honor didn't directly participate in them as by the time of the 2nd 14th that had arrived in Nadzab, Australian forces entered Ley. For Honor and the rest of the 21st Brigade, orders were received to make for Boana, 17.52 kilometres away, on the, to the north of Nadzab to cut off the Japanese evacuation route. Initially stalled by destroyed river crossings, by the 19th the unit was quickly able to overcome the obstacles at the Busip and Bumbok rivers and the Japanese rearguard operation being undertaken. Unfortunately, the battalion's advances appeared to cause some concern to General Doherty, as communications were unreliable due to technology and terrain, which did result in Honor receiving frustrating orders to return to Cap Diddy on the northwest of Ley. This frustration was conveyed by official historian David Dexter, quote, The 2nd 14th Battalion had been hotter on the trail than any other unit engaged in the pursuit, and, had it continued through Boana, it might have caught the retreating enemy, unquote. While Honor was frustrated by the decision, as the 2nd 14th boarded planes for Kaya Pit, further to the northwest of Ley on the 24th and 25th of December, the orders made sense. Despite the best efforts of the 2nd 14th, it had become clear to Brigadier General Doherty that the Japanese 51st Division that Honor had been chasing had escaped and was proceeding to link up with a second Japanese force coming overland from Madang to attack the recently secured village of Kaya Pit. On the morning of the 19th of September, elements of the 2nd 6th Independent Company had taken Kaya Pit and its rough airstrip with the intention of preventing the Japanese from using the Markham or Ramu Valleys to threaten Ley or Nadzab. After securing the village, the 200-odd Australian force managed to hold off a much larger Japanese counterattack. In order to exploit the success, General Vasey ordered the 21st Brigade to gather at Kaya Pit and then push further forward into the Markham Valley. The valley itself is described as, quote, flatter than a pancake for miles and miles in all directions, until it runs into mountains that surround it on three sides, unquote. It starts at Ley and then runs 160 kilometers northwest towards Madang, which had been a Japanese base since the start of the New Guinea campaign. Kai Pit roughly sits halfway along the Markham Valley between these two points. By the 29th of September, the brigade had massed at Kai Pit, and on the 1st of October, orders were received to enter the valley. Despite the comparatively flat terrain, the kunai grass, tributaries, and sporadic villages made the journey difficult, as the tall grass trapped heat, which only served to exacerbate the issue when finding sources of fresh water. On the 4th of October, the battalion had reached Wapun village and found it empty, and along it the nearby 
Pompequado River, which was bone dry as it was a perennial river. Honor then broke up his battalion, sending each company through a northwestern, a southwestern, and a direct western route in order to search for either the water or enemies, whichever came first. Unfortunately, neither would be found. West of Wafoon sat a banana plantation, and that was the general direction Honor had ordered his A company to occupy. He then decided to follow them, much to the annoyance of his newly appointed adjutant, Captain Stan Bissett. Quote, Ralph insisted against my protests in going forward to look for water or possible signs of the Japs. I could never understand how or why he advanced past the spot where A Company had left the track to occupy a higher ground, unquote. Despite the guard assigned to him by A Company, along with his personal bodyguard, Honor had managed to outpace them all and soon encountered Japanese troops, though Honor apparently assumed that these were act forward elements of A Company as they didn't immediately react to his approach. This would be a costly mistake as the Japanese would open fire with machine guns and small arm fire. At Derna, Honor had run under fire to recover mortar bombs for his troops. In Crete, after watching runners get cut down, tied a message to his wrist and set off to deliver the message himself. And at Isarava, he routinely visited frontline patrol points. His desire to not put a subordinate in a unnecessary danger had finally caught up with him. On the 4th of October, 1943, a bullet struck Honor, shattering his left hip joint at the socket. The one soldier that had been able to keep pace with him was also struck several times, and when he struggled to drag his commanding officer to safety, Honor ordered him, quote, I told him to get back. I'd stay where I was in the kunai grass. I couldn't go any further, and you just have to get back to get the news to the battalion to come up quickly, and if I was still here, well, I'd be right. I didn't have an official bodyguard, and I thought he'd gone back with the others, when I said that they had to go back because it would be stupid to have carried me out and then be caught with me, unquote. In fact, his bodyguard, Private Bennett, was with the remaining soldiers from A Company assigned to Honor, and who promptly came running when the shooting started. He refused to leave him as Sergeant Pryor, the wounded man, managed to make his way back to friendly positions and informed them what had happened. Immediately, a patrol was organized under Lieutenant Avery to recover Honor as recounted by W.B. Russell's book. Quote, the patrol reached him but brought considerable fire on itself. The colonel, however, was able to use Lieutenant Avery's wireless set to issue orders through Captain O'Day's COD company to his adjutant. He ordered D company to attack with two platoons and C company to follow in via the trees to the right to roll up on the enemy's left flank. He refused to allow the stretcher party to come forward for fear of endangering the men's lives, but when D company attacked from the left, the stretcher bearers came forward dressed his wounds, and got into safety, more than two hours spent within shouting distance of the enemy. D Company pushed home the attack with great speed and determination, and the enemy were driven back in disorder, unquote. Captain Bissett, after seeing Honor being stretched back, reflected, quote, I saw and spoke with him briefly after he was carried out. It was a tragedy in my view that we were going to lose a great CO in that manner. I knew that he was seriously wounded. I would have been honored to continue service with him, for much longer, as we were good mates, and with his guidance, knowledge, and experience, I would have benefited greatly, unquote. Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor's direct involvement in the war was now over. He was taken by jeep to a holding station in Gusap, where he was stabilized first by the 2nd 4th Field Ambulance on the 5th of October, and then flown to Nadzab, and then on to Port Moresby and the 2nd 11th Australian General Hospital, where he underwent further treatment for the next 29 days. While he was there, he suffered a reappearance of malaria. On the 4th of November, he was transferred to the 2nd 9th Australian General Hospital, where his condition was upgraded from gunshot wound, entry and exit left buttock, to gunshot wound, left thigh, and osteoarthritis, left hip. On the 5th of January, 1944, Honor was transferred to His Majesty's Australian Hospital ship Mananda, and finally arrived in Sydney on the 12th of January where he was then transferred to the 113th Australian General Hospital, which was the wartime designation for the Concord Repatriation Hospital, which is the same hospital frequented by the wild eyes of the AIF, John Barney Hines. From Concord, he'll be transferred to the 115th Australian General Hospital, located within the Austin Hospital in Heidelberg, Victoria, which, as you may know, is otherwise known as the Heidelberg Repatriation Hospital, which was the final resting place of Matron Brace Wilson, who passed away there peacefully in 1957. From there, Honor would then travel by hospital train, the agonizing journey westward, finally arriving at the 110th Australian General Hospital in Perth 
on the 22nd of January, otherwise known as the Hollywood Repatriation Hospital. There, his condition would be upgraded once again from to gunshot wound, left hip, traumatic arthritis, left hip, and a metal plate would be inserted there. While he recovered, he'd be visited by his family until he was discharged on the 14th of July, 1944, with his medical classification being assessed as B2. Like most militaries during the war, a service person's medical capacity was given a letter grading, with A1 traditionally being used to refer to no restrictions to serve, down to D, which meant medically unfit. For Ralph Honor, thanks to his injury, his classification now regarded him as medically fit, but by reason of disabilities of a permanent nature, employable only on certain duties requiring restricted medical fitness, and or not employable in certain climates. While his status would be assessed every six months, considering the severity of his wounds, his frontline service was effectively over. On his discharge, Honor was informed that he would have to wear a caliper in his shoes to help with his walking, something that he was adamant was not going to happen. Instead, he threw himself into his rehabilitation, with the same gusto that he did commanding the 2nd 11th, the 39th and 2nd 14th battalions, even taking up dancing to strengthen his leg muscles. Now, while he would be successful, he would be restricted to walking with a stick and limp for the rest of his life. Hanna would be assigned to the Directorate for Military Training, G, General Branch, Land Headquarters, as a General Staff Officer, Grade 1. There, he was tasked with proceeding training manuals and trying to apply common sense to the military apparatus. You know, good luck to the guy. On the 3rd of January, 1945, Honor would be formally discharged from the Australian Imperial Force and the Australian Military Force. He would then take up the post as Chairman of the Number 3 War Pensions Assessment Appeals Tribunal. There, he would make use of his legal skills and continue to serve his battle brothers and sisters, including men who had served under him in the 39th and 2nd 11th, on matters relating to compensation claims due to injuries sustained during the war. On the 1st of May, 1946, the Honors would welcome their fourth child, John Roderick Honor. In late 1949, the family moved to the Sydney suburb of Seaforth, and Honor assumed the post of Chairman No. 2 War Pensions Assessment Appeal Tribunal, and held that post until he retired in 1968. According to his children, Ralph Honor was a calm, quiet figure that wasn't particularly demonstrative or emotional. Aside from working on the Appeals Tribunal, Honor also held the position of President of the New South Wales Division of the United Nations Association and was an active member of the Australian Liberal Party, including for a period of time as President of the New South Wales Branch, where he is quoted being the first Catholic Liberal New South Wales President. In 1960, Richard Honor, Ralph's father, died at the age of 95. Five years later, his mother Eleanor passed away at the age of 99. Following his retirement from the Appeals Tribunal, Colonel Honor was appointed to be the Australian Ambassador to Ireland, which he saw as a homecoming as his great-great-grandparents emigrated from Ireland 100 years before, and as the family took up official duties, they moved into accommodations in Killarney outside Dublin. As Ambassador, Honor conducted himself with the same level of professionalism as he did as soldier, entertaining foreign and Australian guests with gracious and warm hospitality. On one particular meeting which resounded with him was meeting Lord Louis Mountbatten, who, upon seeing the Honor's DSO and MC pins to his jacket, proclaimed, quote, ah, a real soldier, unquote. Honor's appointment to his ambassador would cease in 1972, and the Honors would formally retire, and like most retirees, would travel Europe, which they did in 1978. They then visited Crete in 1981 to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Crete, and Honor used this opportunity to reacquaint himself with the villages that had aided and sheltered him and his men 40 years before. Sadly, Marjorie Honor would pass away on the 1st of March 1990 after a long illness. Four years later, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor, DSO, MC, would pass away on Saturday 14th of March 1944, age 89, of heart disease following a battle with cancer. According to his biographer Peter Brune, Quote, Honor rose at 7 a.m., showered, dressed, and at 8 a.m., raised the Australian flag in his front yard. He then proceeded back inside. His neighbour, noticing that Honor had not collected his newspaper and his garage door was partly open, entered the apartment to find him passed away on his bed. Unquote. He was survived by his four children. His funeral was at St Mary's Church, North Sydney, on the 20th of May, 1994, and was interred next to his wife in the Northern Suburb Cemetery. 
Ralph Honor is also commemorated in the Ralph Honor Kokoda Education Centre in Concord West in Sydney. And there you have it, folks. That is the life, service, and legacy of Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor, DSO, MC, a man truly deserving of the title, the hero of Kokoda. Now, before I move on, I wanted to share something. On Christmas Day last year, I did the life, service, and legacy of leading air craftsman Noel Irvin Ship, who sadly was killed in action in Vietnam. Well, sometime between recording Sister Kason's episode and finishing the writing of this one, I received a message from his widow. She thanked me for doing his story, for reminding her of things she had forgotten, and for explaining why Stray was in Vietnam. She also told me that she stayed in contact with the man whose ship had replaced, an act that had invariably saved his life. Now, it's things like this which are the real reason why I do this podcast, to bring someone back if only for a day, and to share their story with you. And for that, I am truly grateful. We're excited in this episode are Ralph Honor, Kokoda Hero by Peter Brune, The Battle for Australia, The Boonagona Campaign by Captain W.H.J. Phillips, He's Not Coming South, The Invasion That Wasn't by Peter Stanley, The Australian Militia at War, 1939-1945 by James Morrison, The Making and Breaking of the Post-Federation Australian Army, 1901-1909 by Craig Stockings, The Official History of the Australians Involved in the Second World War, the service record of Ralph Honor, and the unit diaries of the 39th Australian Militia Battalion, the 2nd 14th Australian Infantry Battalion, and the websites of the 39th Battalion Association and the Australian War Memorial. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job Australia's Military History Podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Gangdangara people whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This episode was written, researched, produced, directed, and audio engineered by me, Ross, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. If you do know someone whose story needs to be told, feel free to leave a comment on an episode or send us an email at IWasOnlyDoingMyJobPod at gmail.com. If you like what we do here and you want to support the podcast, the best thing you can do is share this with a friend or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform as it really helps others find the show. And if you want to join in on the conversation, join us over on Discord. And if you want more content, including show notes, photos, transcripts, and my various adventures finding memorials dotted around Australia, head over to our website at www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on all our social media pages at IWODMJ. Don't worry, there are links to everything in the show notes. Join me personally for more bite-sized history over on TikTok and pretty much everywhere else at Doc Winters. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker and do not reflect the views or opinions of any entity, agency, or organization. It is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 4.0 International License. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.